Great. So, hi everyone. Thanks for joining for the demo. So it's uh, what we previously called like the sprint demo. So it's a bit more of a generic um, demo. So not technically sprint, but uh, all the same, uh, functionally the same. Uh, so today we want to look at um, some of the new features that will be coming in the next official release. Um, so all of this stuff is actually already merged into main. So we'll be presenting it's all uh, reachable and I'll tell you how it's reachable uh, a little bit later on because that's also part of some other news um, that we have for you guys. Um, so looking at the agenda today, so we wanted to show um, that we have support for firmware updates for child devices. Um, as this was a new requirement for um, a customer. Um, and a really, really nice feature, the service monitoring support. Then adding support for the remote access plugin. So part of like in the thin edge kind of um, deliverables that we have. And we finally merged the AWS support, um, which is that's been sitting as an open PR for a while. So we were able to merge it now into main. Um, and then I wanted to discuss kind of how you can get access to all this kind of pre-release stuff before official binaries, um, uh, before we do official releases. And then we have some other news, which I'll go on if we have time, because there's a few kind of small improvements that we have um, made anyway. So first of all, I'll hand over to Rena to look through the firmware updates for child devices. So Rena, please. Yes, uh, thanks Ruben. Then I'm going to share my screen. Yes, and we can see it. Yes, nice. Um, OK, uh, so as Ruben said, so this uh, the code itself is already merged to our main repository, uh, but it's not yet in the official release. Uh, but soon, uh, what we are going to do is we are going to release the CHY firmware plugin as a Debian, uh, Debian package. And also, according to this firmware plugin, I actually also changed the touch command. I mean, add, added a new uh, key for set of a firmware plugin. So if you have both new touch and also see it from firmware plugin, and you are going to, you you will be able to play with uh, the, this new feature of seeing it. Um, so the, oh, sorry, there's something wrong, wait a moment. Okay, uh, then, so my device, this is the thing device, let's say, uh, touch config is, uh, this is already connected to community tenant as a sense device or parent device. Then this is this one. And so this feature is actually only available for child devices. So we need a child device and I have already created. Uh, this is the name of demo child one. So as maybe you know that we already have a feature. If we want to have a new child device, uh, just to create a directory and uh, etc touch operation see it while like this and then if we want to add some supported operations and just uh, create a empty file uh, under the that directory for example under this demo child one now i have a, a empty file named see it while formula this is the exactly the operation name what we want to support okay uh then here as you see you can see the demo child one here supporting firmware. Okay. Um, also, it's uh, one thing system CTL status to see it while firmware plugin. So, it's similar to other thin services. Uh, it, it, so, we uh, controlled with the uh, system D, a uh, set of Premier plugin, then now it's running. So that means now it's ready for to receive a new firmware request, then it's created. Um, so this demo child one, so from Kimurosity side, you can see it's already installed something. Simple text version 1.0. So actually, the file itself, I uploaded just text file uh, just for demo purpose. 
So I'm going to update to 2.0 and now I created new operations and let's see. So what happened inside of the CNC device? Uh, so actually we received the operation and then now you can see from this journal log. Um, yes, uh, actually, so we downloaded a file from Cumulosity and then uh, the firmware plugin created the MQTT request so you can see which request was created so here so the topic uh touch child id so demo child one in this demo and the commands link link as a request and from your update and having id uh this id is used between thin edge device and child device and attempts because this is first attempts so starting with one and the name is a farmer name version the version of farmer and shot to five six uh, this is a, a shot to five six of the file so the farmer file itself and the url uh, which uh, child device can access Okay, so then let's imagine. So already uh, child device received this one. So then, for example, uh, we can do curl. This x get paste. Yes, so this means so this URL is available uh, in the local network. So unfortunately now I have only local host, uh, don't have external child device. So I'm basically simulating it. So the content, this is a content of file is a, uh, you can get from the get request. And then now uh, we need to uh, update the operation status. Uh, by sending MQTT message, MQTT path, uh, the pitch demo child, child one, demo child one, right? Yes, demo child one, the commands, commands, response, and firmware update. And here we need a JSON payload and ID. This is the internal ID. Uh, you can get from this request. Copy. Paste. And status. I say successful. You're just missing a closing um, quote after status before the colon. Oh. Uh, so uh, control C it. <laughs> yeah, control C. Yeah. Ah, yes. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So then. Because the plugin received the status update from the child device, let's say, uh, then it updates first executing because you just send the successful immediate uh, directory. And then also updated the inventory of the child device and the market success. The so community side, now you see the Operations marked successful already, and also the inventory is updated to 2.0. Okay, so this is a uh, so yeah the demo part. Then now I want to explain a little bit more. Okay, um, where did the slide show? Play from current slide. 
So, okay. Uh, so this is a very simple diagram. So how Kimurosi, Twins device and Childhood device are working together. So as you saw already in the demo, then always the first the user creates a, a set of farming operations and this is uh, received by uh, this is received uh, by MQTT. And then since the device, once it receives this farming operation, it gets a farming file downloaded from either Cumulosity or external location. It's up to your configuration in your firmware repository in Cumulosity. And then once uh, this download is done, uh, then since the device uh, thinks, uh, okay, it's uh, ready to create a, a request to try the device, and then it published the request uh, via MQTT. So the topic name is always stage and the trial ready, commands, rec, formula update. And then having this payload, ID, temp, name, version, SHA-256, and URL. Yeah, and then child device uh, needs to subscribe this topic. Yeah, then a uh, child device uh, should get a firmware file from this device. Uh, the URL or, or is already provided uh, by a payload of the MQTT request. And then afterwards, child device is supposed to do firmware installation, of course. And once it's done, uh, child device should uh, publish a MQTT message uh, with ID and status. So ID must be the same uh, as the one you get uh, from the request payload. Instead of successor or failed, yeah. Then this device uh, converts the received message to the firmware operation update to Cumulosity, and when it is a successor, it also sends the uh, MQTT message to update the inventory of uh, the device. So there's also a, a variant of this status. So you can use choose also executing. Uh, once if you use executing, uh, so the once uh, since device received that one, it's going to uh, send the 501 uh, smart res request. That means uh, change the operation status to executing. So it's actually nice um, if the firmware installation takes so long time and send it before you start the firmware installation. Yeah, so this is a very short overview. And, and maybe just to mention, so this kind of setup, so the optional sending of the executing was more of a convenience function in case if the child device can't do that or it doesn't make sense because the uh, no firmware operation is so quick to execute. Um, but the same pattern, so this whole setup is very, very similar to the configuration management for child devices. So we basically use the same constructs. So if you're familiar with that, then this concept shouldn't be um, very different to you because uh, it's basically we're just using the same thing. There was a few kind of additional things like with caching and deduplication that were added in as well, um, but it's not a new concept that we came up with. Um, um, oh. Um, sorry, sorry. Uh... Um, I have a question. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. So can you can you go back to the diagram you had? Yes. So what I don't really get is, uh, is there a web server on, on Synage where you can get the files done locally? Yes. Ah, OK. Yeah, yes. and this is. Yeah, that, that's what the child device management, uh, sorry, for configuration management for child devices was doing as well. Ah, okay, very cool. So this means I can have this child device also on a different host and it can connect to Synage Correct. and get everything from there. Perfect, thank you. Okay, then let me go to the next slides. Um, also having some small features. Um, the, there is a request to timeout. Uh, this one is configurable by Tech Config Set Formula Child Update Timeout Seconds. 
And once timeout occurs, uh, the plugin uh, marks the operation failed and with the reason timeout. And but sometimes uh, child device knows uh, it takes longer than the timeout. Then in that case, just publish executing status and that prolongs the timeout. Uh, also, there is download file cache. Um, so imagine, so you have a couple of child devices and all child devices wants to in install the same firmware. And in that case, uh, since the device, the plugin uh, downloads the file only once because having the same file several times, downloading several times makes no sense. So that's why we in, uh, have the file cache. So that saves maybe bound uh, but with. And the last style I created, so what the child connector should do. So what the child device side, uh, uh, you need to have, uh, which kind of script you need to have. It uh, should be quite simple. So first that one uh, needs to subscribe MQTT topic uh, for to receive the request from the plugin. Uh, then afterwards, uh, download a firmware file by HTTP get request from the URL, which is a local network. And then the firmware installation, of course. And then afterwards, uh, publish a response onto the response topic of firmware update and with an operation status, successful, failed, or executing. Okay. Yeah, that's everything that I prepared for today. Uh, is there any questions? Yes, yes, Christoph Strack, I have a question regarding the cache. How long does a, a firmware stay in the cache and is there a way to monitor uh, what uh, what space is occupied by the cache? Currently, no. So um, in the end, it's on the file system. So you could set up a cron job um, as an interim solution before that's supported um, a little bit more robustly from ThinEdge. Um, so, but we do have plans to actually do a bit more than cache management on this. Um, but usually you could just do a, a simple cron job, which is time based or something to say, you know, every X 15 days run and then delete any files older than 15 days or something like that. Um, it'd be quite rudimentary to implement. Okay, um, but, thank you very much. I think everyone's expectation of cash, like cash eviction is always a tricky topic. And so I don't think we weren't going to, our first guess wasn't going to get something that, you know, everyone's happy with. So we figured we can rely on Linux kind of principles to say you can do your own kind of cache manage management uh, yourself for the meantime. And you can monitor like the disk usage through, you know, the collect T mapper and stuff like that. So it's it's not like that you're fully blind on the whole thing. If not, then uh, we'll move. So thanks, Rina, for the presentation. Uh, I really like that feature as well. So there was a lot of kind of hidden nuggets in there, which um, I think uh, people will be quite happy with. Um, but it's our first kind of um, direction into, because you might think, well, how do we do firmware updates with the main device? Um, that was currently out of scope just due to the fact that that required a few more additional mechanisms like, you know, restarting after reboots and stuff. How do we persist state across then petition updates and stuff like that, which was a bit bigger topic to tackle. So for the immediate requirement we had was just child devices were inter um, interesting for that particular customer. So we focused that on first, but also to get a bit of um, move to the fact that we want a more HTTP or like like external interface rather than local file system operations, because then that kind of opens up the containerization stories because then you're going well you don't need to be in the same file system anymore and stuff like that so i think we're gaining experience through that so then that will shape how we handle it on the main device but it's a little bit trickier on the main device cool okay moving on to the other really nice feature that i'm super excited about is the service monitoring so i'll hand over to pradeep for this 
Thank you, Ruben. Uh, let me share my screen. Hope you guys can see my screen. Yes. Yep. Um, the recent version of Kimblocity provides a feature to monitor the services um, of device services from the Kimblocity cloud. So um, this feature is all about how to monitor or how to add the services onto Kimblocity and how to monitor them actually and how to uh, uh, frequently or like you know how regularly to send this health status to the Kimblocity cloud. So um, it, using this feature, actually, uh, one can uh, monitor the Tinet device services as well as the child device services. Um, uh, the the services uh, which are running on a Tinet device have to send the health status message to this topic. Actually, um, uh, Ted Health uh, with the service name, and um, the status message uh, supposed to be containing the. Uh, status of the service and the type of the service the type could be like a uh, system d or any any other string you can send actually how you want to label it um and for the child device uh, one can send uh, the health status message to ted uh, health uh, with the device id and the service name so um the uh, the status message uh, the health status message remains the same actually here as well. so uh, if someone wants to um monitor for example from the Athenate device or Tedge uh, service uh, Tedge mapper C8Y um, so it has to send the status up um, with the type uh, I'm just giving an example here um, Thinet.io um, this has to be sent as a retained message with the QoS2 uh, so this will be uh, sent to the cloud by the map for itself actually we'll we'll talk how, how it will be converted and will be sent to the cloud uh, if someone wants to monitor the service uh, which is running on the child device uh, this has to be sent like this actually um, for example if a service docker service is running on um, external sensor device then um, it has to be sent on this topic uh, with the status message like this um, the type here is system d you can give any uh, label actually here um yeah this is a json message the status message so underneath uh, this um health status message into a service monitor message uh here what we are doing is like we are using a uh, tedge mapper c8y um to translate this health status messages which are received on this topic and translate them into smart rest message uh, like here and send it to the cloud so in case of thin device um the service monitor message will be uh, translated and sent on to um, C8Y slash US. The message uh, type, I mean, the whole message will be looks like this actually. Uh, this one or two is a smart uh, template ID for service monitoring, and it has to have a unique ID for that service and type and the service name itself and the status. This unique ID, uh, uh, will be generated using the combination of uh, device name and the service name for the Thinet device. For the child device, uh, we derive it from using the device name, child ID, and service name because it should be unique across um, across the uh, devices. Um, yeah, this is all about the document, and let me show some demo. Yeah, um, I have already connected. Uh, to uh, Cumulosity. Um, once you have uh, the service monitoring enabled, you can see you'll get an icon like this here. Um, this is enabled only if uh, device has a service monitoring feature enabled. So if we go here, we can see the services which are um, which I already sent. You know the st status of these services. Um, yeah, you can see here um, the the services which are down. They look uh, red actually and also it shows the text on top of it and if it is up it will show um, the services up and running also it shows the type by default we put it as a service as a service type actually and the time is here like, you know when was the last time it was updated um, yeah let me show uh, what happens if I stop a service actually for example I will stop uh, Ted agent service um, here you can see uh, the Tedge mapper 
gets that message and translate it into a service monitor message. Uh, this is a health message which was sent by the TEDGE agent and that will be converted into um, a service monitor message and it will be uh, sent to the cloud here. You can see the TEDGE agent uh, went down now. Um, yeah. The same for all the other services. Uh, if I start it back, it will convert that one and it will send the status back to the cloud. It's up. So same way we can have it for the child device as well. Um, for example, I already have one mostly. Um, I have a created a child device already. Um, so have an external demo device and the service monitoring is enabled here as well. So there's one service which is already running, uh, which is already up. So if I want to um, add another service, I can just, uh, I just mimicking here. I don't have any child device. I'm just uh, simulating this one. For example, uh, system D itself. Um, so um, that will create a, another entry here for the same child. You can see here it creates another child. So um, what happens if a child device does not exist? Um, and when the service message is sent actually for that particular child device, for example, let's do demo one. So what happens is it will create the child device first and then it will forward that service monitor message actually. Let's go to cloud and see. Refresh. So you can see there is one more child added here. And the service is enabled here for that. And there's a service running for here actually. And inside that service you can <clears throat> you can see uh, what are the other things it supports actually. You can, uh, you can add uh, um, alarms and events for that particular service. As of now, we have not enabled or like we don't have, uh, we have not implemented anything here. Uh, one thing I want to hi highlight is like there's no way to delete um, once you add that service here. Actually, it could be same for the device as well. Um, yeah, yeah, so currently that's actually a little bit of the restriction that there's no um, Convolocity Smart Rest template to, yeah. or that I know of, that can easily facilitate deleting. Um, so we're looking at other kind of options, maybe using the REST API um, to remove it. Yeah. Um, or you can mark it specially and then have some kind of cloud um, side that looks for special statuses that are stale and then removes it uh, on yeah. that kind of stale message. Um, For example, yeah, yeah. Sorry, uh, I'm happy to to get this feature in Comulosity to know. We didn't know that it existed. Services. <laughs> when was that introduced? I think 1014. 1014. Oh, really? Yeah. This is yeah, really great. It, <laughs> it is really nice, uh, and so yeah, it's it's I think going to be very very helpful to a lot of people. Okay, and 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 services can also have measurements in itself. I mean, it's getting yes. a bit complicated then, right? Yeah, not really, because it's in the end, it's basically like a device kind of, but it's ah. technically not a Commodity device. It's a, I think, a child edition in Commodity terminology. Mm -hmm. But it has an external ID, which is, and that's why we have to prefix the. Um, the main device, child device, and the service ID. So you have a unique thing across the whole tenant. Otherwise, you get into trouble. Great, thanks. Yeah. And one more thing is I just set the status to unknown. You can see um, the status is different other than up and down, actually. So you can set whatever um, label you want, um, which will help you later maybe to filter out. Uh, is the type doing something right now? Uh, I saw that you had multiple types, system Ds, so that, that's allowed, looks like. Yeah, it, it's up to you to define how yeah. you want to use it. Yeah. So maybe on that note, I can show sure, why okay. this feature is really, really, really cool. Uh, sorry, uh, were you finished, uh, Pradeep? Yeah, yeah, I'm done. Um, yeah. Or you can take 
so I'll I'll just show you. So it's more a continuation on, you know, to try to inspire people how to use this feature. Um, so I have my Raspberry Pi at home, kind of sitting in the network, and you can see, cool, I have my services. So the reason why we chose service is because we wanted to kind of be init system agnostic, because in case if you're using init D or system D, like, do you really care about that? Generally, no. Um, so I wanted to just say, hey, okay, let's, oh, we wanted to say that we wanted to just use service because it is a service. However, you can extend this to whatever you want. So for example, I have created a new, um, to hopefully inspire people, um, that I have a container monitor. So let's say I want to install a container using Comelocity to say, let's do a container group. So that would be um, similar to, let's say, a Docker Compose. I'm just going to install a Hello World generator. So that's like the name suggests, it will generate Hello Worlds. Um, but where will that do? Um, so we'll generate it on the events. Then suddenly that, so we have a service running now, which is generating every two, three seconds, a, an event saying hello world. And we can actually see, because I'm on a Raspberry Pi, so I actually have a Debian system, but this is showing that's con, uh, coming from Alpine Linux, because my image that I deployed there is Alpine Linux. But if I want to kind of monitor, is, is the process running or not? This is where this is fantastic because I now have a representation of this deployed Docker Compose project. I've called it a container group just to say it's, you know, trying to use generic terminology and not Docker specific te um, terminology. That I can then show that this status is up because all of the, I don't know, the containers running inside the project, like the Docker Compose project, are happy. So I know it's up. So you can kind of mix it in to say, well, if we have a package, which then you can kind of link the software and software deliver services and then services, you get some tracking when you do that. Um, so it's really, really powerful to then use for any kind of models you have. So we can also do like multiple deployments, have another Hello World generator and stuff like that that it really works nicely for all of the tooling that you have available um, to really do what you want and to solve your problems. So now we have two Hello World generators. And then the services, I get a really nice view. Ah, OK, it's I had two services now, so I kind of know what's happening on the device. Um, and then also in the other aspect, you can remove stuff. And this is kind of where it has a bit of the the shortfall um, because we can't delete a service, but as a kind of like a interim um, still next best kind of solution, uh, you can still use the status. So once it, I think deleting it takes a little bit longer because it's, I didn't do an abrupt delete. It does a nice delete. Um, but you see how there's only one event going now. So if I go back to services, I've now marked it as uninstalled because that's just what I chose. Um, but Comelocity gives it a kind of like a different icon. So I think there's like th four different icons up, down, unknown, and kind of maintenance, I guess. But you can then kind of do your own logic that maybe on the cloud side until we have a delete service kind of logic, um, you can have that maybe some kind of like um, event processing and then saying, hey, let's look for services which are uninstalled and delete them and stuff like that. But it shows it's really, really powerful for to do your own custom implementations like this. And so for that custom implementation, um, it's now in our FinEdge kind of repository or like organization, and I just call it a container plugin. Um, so I can post the link and it's just to show how do you deploy a container using the software management plugins that FinEdge already provided and in conjunction with the service. And that makes it a very, very, very cool feature. Um, so you can read the documentation there. So this is just a community based plugin kind of, you know, side stuff, um, but just to show how easy it actually is and it's not too complicated. Um, to try to spark some 
yeah, additional creation of uh, plugins in the future. OK, then moving on to the next topic. Um, so another nice feature that we have available um, from our Thick Edge uh, colleague, colleagues um, that we now have a new plugin called Remote Access. So I can kind of see it here in the software list. So this is a Comelocity specific function um, because it's relying on the Comelocity Cloud Remote Access feature. So now part of the package, we also have this a remote access plugin. So you can see it here. Um, and what this enables you is if you have the rights, because you need rights to be able to see this magic remote access tab, uh, it's not the default admin rights. Um, you can configure stuff to either connect with WebSSH, which is the classic kind of, um, you know, using the UI and stuff. However, that's not really the killer feature in that respect. So that kind of works um, as expected. Um, I can connect, so I'm on my Raspberry Pi, and this is connecting via the cloud to my device. So this is not in my local network, so it means my device doesn't need to be sitting in my local network, which is very, very cool because A, you don't have to then expose a public port because that's generally bad practice. So the agent is establishing the connection from the device and then establishing it to the cloud um, to make the connection only to the local uh, loopback address on port 22. But what is really cool, and I don't think um, it's kind of newish, um, I think also in 1014, is this pass-through feature. So pass-through is a commonality feature where I can actually use that same kind of mechanism I can kind of show you how that happens. So we can see on the control page for this device, if I want to establish an SSH connection to this device, I can actually do this from the console, which is much better for user experience rather than the web SSH. So to make this happen, there's actually an open source um, CYLP, so Comelocity Local Proxy, um, where you can connect to, so you can see the operation created. Now I'm in, on my console, on that device, it's going through the cloud, but it feels super, super responsive. So imagine doing that in the web SSH, that would be a very, very bad experience. Um, so it means you can kind of do some really wonderful stuff that you can do like SCP um, directly, one off SSH commands, and stuff like that. You can do that all from your console in a secure manner. And then here comes a really killer feature. So if I wanted to, let's say, so I've disconnected and I want to connect again, and maybe on the device I have a local web server that's only exposed to local host, but I want to maybe do port forwarding and have a look at that web server, but locally on my machine. So there's actually a really cool feature because it's SSH. You can do whatever you can in SSH. So I can actually do a port forwarding to say on the locally on the device, I want to port forward port 8000 to my local on this machine, 8010. So if I just establish that, we can see that the connection happened. Now, magically, this is from my remote device. This is the web server. I can then interact. So I installed Monit because um, I was playing around with that. Um, so you can really access any kind of like ports. You can kind of forward it using the magic of like SSH uh, to make all of this possible. And once I disconnect it, then it's not available because then the connection's been severed and then it's no longer mapped or port forwarded to this um, port. So that alone is really, really nice. Um, I think in previous Comelocity releases, maybe this wasn't actually activated by default. Uh, I think it was hidden behind maybe a tenant option, um, but I would definitely recommend it. I think in the newer settings, it's now enabled by default, um, but it is a really, really nice feature. And then it's also part of the Thin Edge offerings, which we'll be installing by default um, because it is so useful. 
Okay, looking at time, I'll quickly run through the AWS. So we we have then support now for AWS. Um, so we can basically what we have. So I'll, I'll connect back to my Raspberry Pi, and we have exactly like oops, Hedge Connect. So exactly like um, Azure and Comelocity, now there's a new one, AWS. So this is thanks to the original work from RedGuard, uh, Consult Red, I think, Consult Red, yeah. Uh, and then continued and we kind of uh, cleaned up a few things um, from uh, Marcel, a little bit of cleaning up and we got it merged. So you can now connect ThinEdge to AWS. Now, the initial device registration is still a bit clunky um, because we don't have CSR support, so certificate signing requests, um, because we're still exploring exactly how that works and, and stuff from the AWS side. Uh, so at the moment, it's still kind of very much self-signed kind of certificates, and you have to upload the certificate itself. So I'll just show how that works. And just to kind of aid me so I'm not clicking around heaps, um, I just have a nice bootstrapping thing for me. So for AWS, I won't go too much into the inner in workings of AWS. I'm also not 100% across it, um, but we want to create a thing. So I want to create a single thing. I'll just give it the name here for the device ID. Let's just do a shadow next. Then I'll use my own certificate. Choose my file. So this is the certificate, like the public certificate. Go next. You need to select the policy. So this is all documented, and we have an example policy to do this because it's again AWS kind of magic. Um, so now I've registered my device. So I'm not really doing anything just yet. Um, so normally you would do then, for example, the Tej Connect AWS. Um, so this kind of just bootstrap script that I have available as a gist um, just kind of says, here's all the information you need, and it gives you a bit of directions here just because I needed help to remember what order to do things in. Uh, and here it's just kind of waiting, saying, just press enter, and then we'll connect. But before I do this, just for demo purposes, I'm just going to establish an MQTC test client to this device so we can see our messages being sent and stuff like that. So if I just subscribe now to my topic, let's make that a little bit bigger. Um, so these will be the messages that come down or that come from the device. So I've now set everything up. So let's just press enter. We can kind of see that the the bridge connection stuff is going on, saying, hey, yes, we've, we've got you. Um, we're starting the bridge. And we can already see here a flurry of messages. Um, and we can already see that even the messages that were coming from this Hello World generator are also coming to AWS. And this is actually, it's able to connect both to AWS and Comelocity. So that kind of opens up a whole lot of other kind of um, avenues to maybe using both clouds, um, Comelocity device management, or for specific use cases uh, that can also go into AWS. So we forward the events, alarms, um, and I think health check messages as well, or like health status messages um, and everything. Um, so that's also, you can kind of get your data uh, there now. So we're still gathering a bit of like um, info about, you know, the topic structure, recommended topic structures in AWS, um, because we are not the AWS experts. Um, but we're open to if someone has um, better experience with topics, you know, feel free to reach out, create a GitHub issue, and we can talk about how to better um, facilitate that. But at least as a kind of first, hey, this is at least getting data, and for demo purposes, it's it's fantastic. You can also, uh, I think, publish uh, to a device. Um, I'll probably skip over that because I'll have to remember what the actual long. Um, <laughs> Topic is in AWS land, but you can also do that. Um, and that works quite nicely as well. So you can uh, subscribe to 
sub. Yeah, I think shadow or something. Yeah, so you can also do that. Cool. Then for the kind of miscellaneous topics. Um, so everything that we showed here, I mentioned before that you can actually use what we've shown here and have access to it before the official um, release. So we're excited to announce that due to some nice offerings from CloudSmith, um, that they have a nice free OSS um, public offering um, that allows us to host our Debian packages for free. Um, so you can actually get access to pre-release versions from CloudSmith. So CloudSmith is a package hosting service, um, and we've kind of, we've tweaked our build process that we have different kind of let's say channels that we have published our Debian packages. So for the official releases, we have like the Tetra release. So that's one to one to what goes on our GitHub like releases page that you can see here. So starting from 0 0.9, um, we have that in here. But if you want to try pre-release versions, every time we merge to main, and that's why we call it tedge-main, because that's the branch name, we publish to the tedge main repository. So you can see here, we have a whole lot of versions, because every time we've merged into main, we've published it. So you can actually then hook up um, with apt get um, to actually access these packages and install the latest and greatest um, in your development kind of setup to check out these new features before the official release is available. All the details how to do that are listed here. Um, I can post the link. It's currently not on the website. We're still working out where to put it exactly there. Um, but at least like the markdown in details, it details like the official releases and also the pre-releases and it goes into the naming uh, schema that we've used, so the version sy syntax, um, so this automatic versioning that we have um, to kind of be clear what kind of version is it, what, what git commit is that related to. So that is going to be super helpful, and in the future, uh, we're also then looking to maybe change like our get install script to maybe utilize the apt packages. Um, but it's still up in discussion, but you can at the moment using installing and upgrading just native apt commands, which is really, really nice. And in addition, um, if you have a Raspberry Pi Zero, we now have a separate repository because that was using the ARM v6, which has caused a few name conflicts in the Debian world. Um, that is also available. So you can then select if you have a Raspberry Pi Zero, you're also not, um, you have a, an available install path, which was previously not possible. You had to build it yourself. So that's a really, really nice offering from CloudSmith I, I, and they've been really responsive. So big thanks to them. Short other notes um, where it's not kind of demo stuff, but interesting kind of um, features. Uh, so we now support custom fragments in all alarms. So for main devices and child devices, that was previously missing. Um, we also switched to using muscle builds. And you like to say, what is muscle? So uh, muscle is basically the, the C libraries that we use. So previously we were using GNU, um, but we switched to muscle because that allows us to statically um, build the, or have statically linked binaries, um, which means they're more portable and for those people who use Alpine Linux, aka maybe containerization, um, it makes it a lot easier to install in Alpine Linux because Alpine Linux doesn't have GNU by default. Um, so we're looking to make it a little bit more cross compatible um, with different installations and more portable. Then internal building, we also make it easier to cross compile the binaries. Um, so for different architectures, uh, this is now working really, really nice thanks to Cargo ZigBuild. Um, so you can cross compile if you're on an ARM 64, M1 Mac uh, or M1 uh, Mac OS or Windows or like a Linux system, um, AMD 64 or whatever, it 
you can actually build for all of the four architectures. Then also we have for those who are a fan of dev containers and using VS Code, um, we actually have a dev container definition now on the project um, to make it easier for new developers to get up and running and to install all the dependencies that they need, um, like even installing Rust and all of that kind of things. And to also assist like running integration tests, which we also then use, you know, Python libraries uh, to get this running. Uh, so it helps reduce or like lower the bar or the entry point for people to get up and running. And how do I build? I, maybe I want to experiment with Rust um, to make that easier for people. So that concludes the main, um, like the agenda now. Are there any last remaining questions uh, before we close? Yes, when is this all available in a public build? In an official build? Mm -hmm. uh, to be determined. Um, we don't have an official release date yet. Um, so we're still working that out. But I would really encourage, so the release build, so if you're not looking at a production kind of environment, then you should not be shy using the pre-release channel because the pre-release channel goes through our integration tests as well. I'm not saying it won't be bug free, but you can use those features. So everything we showed now, you can have access if you use the pre-release channel. So then that kind of removes the, the burning desire to have a, a like immediate need for an official release. Um, but yes, we're looking in the next week or two, I guess, uh, to do a an official release. Might have a few cleanup things to do first. Okay, sure. Okay, if there's no other further questions, you can always reach out to us on GitHub. Discord or um, the various uh, communication mediums, um, and we're more than happy to help. So then, thanks everyone for listening. Um, oh. Again, one one remark. Yeah. I think this is absolutely fantastic work, and we we should tell the world about it much more. Um, uh, and we have to bring it to our customers. It's, I like it very much. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, great for the feedback. Yeah, we. I, I think a lot of like the features and the build improvements and getting getting versions out to people earlier, I think, is also super important. And also in the feedback process. Um, so if people can use the versions earlier and it has a clear version as well, then we can fix bugs earlier. Um, and you can get to use all the new goodies earlier and sooner in the development process, um, which is great. Because we, we we don't always want to be the blocker and go, okay, we haven't cut an official release, but in the development process, you're you're okay with using pre-releases most of the time. Yeah, thank you. I mean, also in terms of marketing, right? Yeah. Hey, oh, and Han Nova Mesa and hey, yeah, this is Synergy is the, the coolest thing of the world, right? We have some, yeah, it could be we have a few kind of uh, potential to be at Hanover Meso in a few booths. Um, yeah. Things are still getting finalized, but yeah, that's um, looking fairly good. Thank you. Great, then thanks everyone. Uh, apologies for the 10 minutes over, uh, but I hope we showed enough goodies to make it worthwhile. Okay, then thanks everyone and have a nice day.